Welcome to the Side Chat Podcast. This week we'll be discussing all things Mustangs, Sky Ponies. I would like to first say uh, I'm glad that we're actually back to talking about War Thunder. I needed a couple week break, which is why we did the question and answer session and then the E3 coverage. I thought those would be kind of fun topics, but we are back discussing planes and tanks and all things War Thunder related. A little burnt out from doing all those weeks of uh, ammunition armament, but so we're back on track. And the reason I've decided to put this podcast up and now is because I've seen a lot of misinformation, and it's pretty frustrating. My primary country I play is Amer- America, America, and uh, this is one of the planes that kind of disappoints me the most in the in the way it's used and the battle ratings. And there's so much misinformation out there, and some of it's due to in these states we have something called the Military Channel, History Channel, which might as well be the Pro P51 Could Do Anything Channel. Um, but and I'm not here to bash the, the fanboys of the Mustang because it is a pretty plane. And a lot of people argue it's the the best fighter of World War II. And I think it's hard to define what the best fighter was. Yeah, it exceeded in the role of bomber escort and was the best option for that, which is why it's famous. But I would like to argue that there's other planes like the P-47, the, the, you know, the Tempest, and the BF-109s, and the 190s. You can make an argument for all those things on what they did well. So... We're going to take a trip down the development of the P-51s, and I'm going to try to give you as much real-world information. I'm going to try to do kind of a uh, elaborated version of some of these and just try to highlight the big changes that happened between developments. We could go into little bitty details and nitpicking, but for the most part, I want to give you guys uh, a you know grasp of the information about these planes so that you'll be educated. And, you know, at least you know, talk about and then know what to expect from War Thunder in the way of performance and the variations that will be coming. So we will actually, I'll kick this off by highlighting the Mustang Mark 1. Not that. Because that is kind of where it all started. So, P-51 was originally built for the Royal Air Force. The British were happy with the Spitfire and the way it was rolling with the air superiority dogfighting role. But they needed something for ground attack, so they went to North American and asked them to build them P-40s. North American didn't want to do that. They said, we can build you something better. They had 90 days, and they had a flying prototype up in 90 days. Pretty impressive. The original Mustang, like the one here we're looking at in the game, all uses the Allison V-17 10 engines. And I will be posting pictures from my own personal collection of uh, a place near here that I live that has, it's a world's, it's almost one of the world's biggest private collections of flying uh, warbirds, and he has a whole room full of Allison V-1710s. It's kind of neat. Plus, he has some other variations of P-51s that still fly. Uh, it's the only—I think it's the only P-51C that's flying in the world today, or even exists in the world today. So I'll show you pictures of that later. But like I said, Allison V-1710. To give you an idea of what that means, the Allison V-1710 is an inline engine that was used in the P-39, the P-63, the P-40, the XP-5. XP-55 Ascender, it's the two engines that power the P-38, and it's on the later versions of the F-82 Mustang, and we will cover the F-82 Twin Mustang at the end of this podcast. So, this plane was originally designed to fill the fighter-bomber role and also operate as a recon plane. And so, the delivery of the Mustang 1, I'm going to call it Mustang 1, it's called Mark 1A in the game, but for my sake, I'm going to call it Mustang 1, because that's all the documentation I've received calls it a Mustang one. Um, so the original plane had 250 cals and 430 cals. It had two guns mounted in the nose. The British decided to opt out of that and go with the four Hispano cannons on the wings. The numbers I found have it performing at 388 MPH at 15,000 feet. I think that this plane is massively, massively overperforming in War Thunder, and I've I've cried and cried and cried and cried and punched my pillow, but nobody seems to care. As I just I can't see me, but I'm, I just put my head down on my desk. Uh, the numbers though on this note card, and I know the note cards aren't always correct, but it says 401 MPH at 1700. So according to this note card, it's it's wrong. But maybe if we uh, beg Mr. Walrus right, nice enough, he'll do us a flight model analysis of Mustangs. Uh, 111 were actually made it, built and made it to the RAF. So, like I said, this wasn't that, there wasn't a ton of these uh, kind of flying around. 
And then you're going to see maybe some dang game, something called the Mustang 2, the Mustang 3, and the Mustang 4. And what that is is the Mustang 2 is the P-51A, Mustang 3 is the Mustang, uh, the P-51 B and C, and the Mustang 4 is a D variant of the P-51. So we might actually see right here, you know, Mustang 2, Mustang 3, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, just sharing it out there. But let's go back to U.S. development. America. First variant of the P-51 ordered by the U.S. Army was called the A-36 Apache. There was 500 ordered on April 1942. It was originally called the Apache, then it kind of got the name the Invader, but then they finally went with the British name Mustang. Still powered by the Allison V-1710 engine, it was built as a dive bomber. It had dive brakes, and it was also had two hard points for 500 pound bombs. Top speed was 358 MPH at 5,000 feet, kind of a dog. It was able to score 101 air-to-air -air victories in World War II. Kind of impressive until you read that they lost 177 of them due to low altitude operations. It had 650 cows and had a max ceiling of 25,000 feet. And it still had this kind of three-bladed prop that you'll see was ditched later for a four-bladed prop. So, uh... Hopefully someday we will see the A-36 Apache Endgame. Should be coming. Wasn't you know, they actually sent one to the British to test, and the British despised it, I guess. So that's why the plane didn't have a huge role. And I, the 500 that were built, I think, uh, do I have the number here? Not that many actually hit service either, to my knowledge. So the P-51A came into existence, and 1,200 of those were ordered in August of 42. The U.S. Uh, Army needed planes to be fighter roles only. So there was no ground attacking for that plane, and there was no die breaks. It was fighter only, and it operated below 22,000 feet. Uh, its performance was slightly better, 390 MPH at 20,000 feet, with a service ceiling still of uh, 31,000 feet, it says in my notes. 35 were used as recon. 50 were sent to the RAF as replacements. That's where the Mustang 2 came in play. This plane still saw service until 1945. Only 310 were built due to the Packard Merlin being an option. And I'll get to that in a minute. The P-51A had 450 cows. So, not once again, not a very significant variant of the P-51. You should see it in game sooner or later. But it's still a stepping stone in development to get to where we were. Now I'm going to talk about the P-51B and C, and this is where everything started happening. The P-51D is famous strictly out of the numbers produced and the role it played, but the P-51B and C are the big leap in technology, and then the the advancements happened in the B and C models, and then the D finally came available, and that's what became famous. So uh, the B, Cs, and Ds actually have very, very, very comparable performance numbers. So the Packard, so we have the British, you know, the Rolls-Royce Merlin 61, which was built for Spitfires. Packard got it under license, and the Merlin's, the Packard Merlin was one of the best engines of World War II. Uh, to give you an idea of how much more dominating that Packard engine was over the Allison, it had 490 more horsepower at 25,000 feet, and was 100 miles an hour faster at 30,000 feet. So just massive performance gains out of nearly the same aircraft. It, it was stupid not to go with this engine. Um, due to the big, and we're going to flip here to, like I said, last time you'll see the Mustang on the screen here in War Thunder, and I'll be going to the American one. You'll see that they moved to the four-blader prop. You have that huge Merlin engine installed there. And then there was a big, oh, belly scoop added underneath there to keep that engine cool. That was one of the challenges they had. They had to move the firewall around to accommodate the big engine. But the other thing to note is that they were able to get the wings to hold uh, up to a thousand pounds a piece and I'll put those big bombs there. So that was the B's and C's had that capability. And uh, let's move on to my next page of notes. The P-51B saw a little bit of action in the Pacific Theater with the Flying Tigers and then it hit service and December 5th 1943 it was the longest range uh, bomber escort to that point so this plane made a the P-51B made a splash very early 
It did a tiny bit of fighter bomber rolls, but it was mainly as a bomber escort slash fighter. I'm going to let you guys in on a secret, though, when I say Mustang uh, P-51 B and C. And you ask, well, what's the difference between B and C? And I see that question asked in the general chat. I see it asked on Reddit. I see it asked in the forums. I see it asked on YouTube. And there's so much misinformation about there. I hear that superchargers. I hear guns. It had extra fried chicken, chicken in the back. Uh, more freedom. The B's and the C's, guys, are the exact same aircraft. The B's were built in Ingl Inglewood, California, and the C's were built in Dallas, Texas. The, the factory in Dallas, Texas was open because they couldn't meet the demands of the orders that were coming in. So it, it was just, that's that's all it is. It was just built in a different place. Um, you know, same, same plane. And there was 1,900 B's made. 308 went to the British, and then there was 17... Almost 17, over 17,000 C's built, and 636 of those went to the British. So those were known as the Mustang III. Um, halfway into production of those lines, they decided to put in the 85-gallon fuselage tank behind the pilot, which is what the radio sits on top of. And I'll get to that a little story about that in a minute. But that's the same that that's the same fuel tank that's in the D variant. So that's when the plane started having its super long-range capabilities. With the 110-gallon drop tanks on it, the Bs and Cs could fly from London and Berlin and back. So, like I said, the Bs and Cs had that long-range capability uh, as well. So, I'm going to move on. There's a couple pictures of the Cs up as I'm talking. We're going to talk about the P-51D. A lot of information on this guy because there was a crap ton of them made. 8,000 P-51D variants were made, so just nuts. Um, the biggest changes when you move the P-51D is the canopy right here. We have the bubble canopy. I'll put up some pictures. The P-51Bs and C started using what's called the Malcolm Hood, which is, I guess, the best visual I have for you besides pictures is this. The Spitfire has that weird kind of bubble canopy. Uh, that's called the Malcolm Hood. The Bs and the Cs experimented with that, but the U.S. was so far behind on canopy design that they finally realized, you know, freaking late in the war, oh, if our pilots can see what's behind them, they can, you know, see the target? I don't know, anyway. So, uh, canopy is the biggest change. With the canopy installation, though, there was this dead area of surface that the uh, air went over, and then you had dead area back here on the tail, and they realized quickly that they needed to put this big-ass dorsal fin back there to help with uh, vertical stability, or sorry, horizontal stability. Um, so that really helped the pilots out. You know, they didn't have an instructor in War Thunder to hold their hand like we do. And then it was, and I guess I'll get to this, the P-51D has 650 cals. The Bs and Cs had 450 cals. On the Bs and Cs, the 450 cals were laid in at a 45 degree angle and they were highly prone to jamming because the ammo was fed in at a weird angle and they would kink. They redesigned the wing a bit for the D model so that the ammo, they could fit more ammo, but the ammo was also coming in at the direct angle. Uh, so that was very, very important. And the last thing I will say real quickly about armament for the P-51Ds is that there's a little mistake in War Thunder, according to my research, is that the D-25s and on were able to carry HVR rockets. And we have on the P-51D-20, we have HVR rockets. And on the D-5, we have... Uh, HVAR, HVAR rockets. So, according to my research, those aren't supposed to be there. Just, just thought I'd point that out. Um, and then, the P 51Bs and Cs from the numbers I saw tested operated at 440 mph at 25,000 feet. And the P 51D uh, <laughs> flew 437 miles an hour at 25,000 feet. So, you're looking at only a three mile degradation. So that could just be the difference between two aircrafts. You know, the airframe might have been slightly out of line or, you know, could have been less sunny that day to make that difference. I mean, they're so close, we're, I'm not going to sit here and split hairs. The only thing I find difference between the P-51D and the P-51B and C is that the P-51D's two-stage supercharger was slightly modified to handle better at low altitude, but had a little bit of uh, less performance at high altitude. Or yeah, better performance at low altitude, slightly degraded performance at high altitude, but same two-stage, you know, two-speed supercharger on the Bs and Cs and the Ds. So nothing really engine-wise besides some tweaking. Please don't shoot me if you have sources of 
six more HP because I put in a new oil filter. Because I, I will, I will kick you in the nuts. Um, <laughs> I've seen stuff like that happen on the forums. So, eight thousand of these were built, like I mentioned. The British got six hundred of these called Mustang Fours. And the uh, da, 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 the D twenty five slash thirty, I couldn't find the exact lot number. Was had a cool thing, and I'll go so quick on this one because this one should have it. Is that it had tail warning radar. Uh, what that would tell them is that if something was directing on your tail, either two or three miles back, there would be a audio warning, like beep 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 or something. I'm not sure what the sound was. That would tell you that something was on your six. So it's kind of a neat little feature, not in War Thunder, of course. Uh, I don't even know how they would do that, but anyway. So when you hear P51 D-30, D-5, D-20, uh, what does that mean? Well, the D-20 or whatever is a lot number, and they'd run a certain number of planes, and then they make a refinement, and then it would get a new lot number. So there, there aren't any huge changes with most of these lot numbers. It's just little refined changes, you know, change of production, new lot number. Um, you know, so you can kind of see it as a... I guess date introduced system, but there's no huge difference between the D-5 and a D-30 except little things, little additions. The P-51D did see some Pacific action in the late war. The problem why they didn't use Mustangs originally uh, in the game was because they trusted the P-38 due to its two engines to fly them over the water safely, and uh, with a P-51, you have one engine. If you have an engine failure, you're going to be swimming with the sharks, literally. When they captured Iwo Jima, and that was about the time that the action in Europe was dying down, they decided to start pushing the P-51s into the Pacific Theater as bomber escorts and recon, and then they started doing attacks over mainland. There's a lot of footage of it doing strafing attacks over mainland Japan as well. Um, so I'd add that in there, that P-51s did see action in Japan against Japan. If you ever see Empire of the Sun, it's kind of a neat movie where the P-51 comes in and young Christian Bell starts screaming his little head off. Kind of found that child obnoxious in that movie, but still a great piece of cinema. Um, and I think that's all I want to say about the D. Real quickly, there's two other variants that you might see in War Thunder called the P-51H. That was a lightweight model that was built to uh, counteract the late model 109s. The P-51Ds were actually being outperformed in the climb by the late model 109s, so they, in response, North American built a lighter, faster uh, P-51. Unfortunately, it didn't get into the theater until way too late, and um, it never saw action. To my knowledge, it never actually shot at another airplane. These were the last P-51s into U.S. service until 1957. They were put into National Guard units, and I don't even believe they were deployed for Korea. So, that I would throw that in there. Um, that should be a neat plane, no, for War Thunder at a Bearcatish battle rating, maybe. And then you have the P-51K, which you might see. That is the same as a D, different canopy, but was also built in Dallas. And then, real quick, I want to point out that the Australians had P-51s. Uh, they had something called the Mustang Mark 20. Those were P-51Ds built out of kits, and then there was. 120 uh, Mustangs called Mark 21s, Mark 22s, Mark 23s. Those were built from kits as well, but they used sometimes like Merlin 60 or Merlin 70 series engines, whatever they really had laying around, they uh, put to use. So the freaking P-51 variants, all total, almost 17,000 of those planes were built. That's why that plane was famous, just because of sheer volume. And it did really well in the bomber escort role. Don't, don't hit me. Um... Like I said, real quick, though, I'll tell you my P-51D story. I don't know if this is true or not. I was watching a show once that talked about the Red Tails, and this is kind of sad, but I kind of find it funny. The Red Tails trained with the P-40s for a long, 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 long time, and they were sitting in France, and they got delivery of the new P-51Ds. And one of the squadron com uh, leaders or commanders decided, I'm not going to read the manual. I'm going to go fly this beautiful, shiny plane in front of me. And he didn't know about the 65-gallon tank that was behind his head. When that was full, you're not supposed to do low-altitude maneuvers. The sucker went straight up and did a hard churn, and the plane just listed over, and then he came straight back down and exploded on the runway in front of the entire uh, Tuskegee Airmen. And then it was kind of like, oh, next man up. Who wants to learn how to fly a Mustang? <laughs> 
I know it's not funny seeing somebody laugh, but I mean, I just, it, it, <laughs> you know, it's kind of, I mean, that's what happens, you know, like brand new Troy, um, read the destru- reading instructions is a life lesson from that, I guess. Uh, you know, I don't think they included that in the Disney movie. Um, we're going to talk a bit about the F-82 twin Mustang, and I'm going to wrap this up. The F-82 twin Mustang, let me click on it here, More Thunder, is an absolute ugly, despicable thing. Uh, and why the hell did they build it? Well, it was originally built to escort the B-29s to drop the atom bombs. They weren't sure if they were going to have to fly from, like, London to, you know, southern uh, Germany. That's a long trip. And they were worried about maybe flying from, like, the Philippine Islands to, you know, mainland Japan. That's a long trip that the P-51Ds couldn't make, or another plane could really make. And so the P- the twin F-82 was built to try to fill that mission role. It was never needed, of course, because we got closer and closer and closer. Um, the original, let me say this real quick, the P-51, or sorry, the twin Mustangs were kept after that uh, as a night fighter. We had something called the P-61 Black Widow, which did a great job. One of my favorite planes, when you see me, when that P-61 Black Widow hits the game, I will be trolling so hard. But until that time... Uh, the F-82 filled that role as a night fighter, and it got a radar pod installed. And then that's what this other seat does here. I believe it's the left seat flies, the right seat has the radar pod. Um, and it was, as a night fighter, replaced the aging P-61. Interesting fact, a couple things that the F-82 does hold under a trekker belt. It has the first kill over Korea when we entered that conflict. And it set the record for nonstop flight from Hawaii to New York. Kind of crazy. I wouldn't. I I can't stand to be in a 747 from like Florida to Seattle. How the fuck did somebody make it one of these things from Hawaii to New York? My hats off. Um, this plane had six Browning M350 Kells right there, as you see. That is correct, as it is in game. There is 25 millimeter five inch or 127 millimeter rockets. Those are not in game. There should be more of those. And the bomb weight is correct. It could hold up to 4,000 pounds of bombs. There are two variations of this plane that you kind of need to note. The A's and the B's, the F-82 A and B's, had Packard Merlins, which performed much better than the C's and the E's. I don't know if there's a D. C's and the E's that are, uh, we have the E in game, and those have 1710 Allisons in them because they didn't really need high-altitude operations out of these planes anymore. So if the F-82 A or B gets added to the game, fly that instead of the E because the... I don't, this plane does not have a mission role in the game anyway. But this plane was not complete shit in real life. It actually had a uh, role, and it tried to fill that job. So, um, I hope that's some information to you guys to, like, you know, so you at least know what you're talking about when uh, when you go on the forums and you argue about Mustangs. Like I said, I'm not going to sit here and say a P-51 outturns a BF-109 at 15,000 feet every time. I just, you know saw way too much information, misinformation when it came to seeing the variants and the lot numbers. Uh, people were making up anything, it seemed like, to uh, value their argument. I do have a couple other podcasts in the works that are taking up quite a bit of time. Uh, first one I think is pretty neat. We're going to be talking about, first, we're going to do a couple on tanks, because I know you guys have been asking about when I'm going to do stuff on tanks, and I've been reluctant it because tanks aren't quite as long as where I want before I waste the time to research it but we will be doing two podcasts one on each country about how to kill uh, their tanks so we're going to talk about the armor and where the weak spots are on the armor so if you have one shot where do you shoot that one shot that ideal shot to take down a tank in one hit so that will be coming up in the future and then I'm kind of excited about this one we will be doing a 4th of July podcast with Kobe Wobi because his grandfather actually served on B-17 and B-24s in World War II and in Korea so we will be talking about U.S. bomber formations and U.S. bombers in general and then I'm sure he has some stories from his old grandpappy so like I said um, if I you know I, I did check this Mustang information with almost five different sources I tried to get as much information as possible there is some misinformation please don't kick me in the nuts if you uh if you find something I said is wrong, I would love to hear it because I, I love learning too. So uh, until next time, you stay classy and do well in your Mustang so it doesn't keep getting a worse and worse battle rating. Please don't don't fail us. We're all counting on you. 
Bye-bye.